A few not so good men. You've heard of the movie A Few Good Men? Well, if Jesus were to have written the script, it would have had to have been a few not so good men. We are a few chapters into Luke. We are going through the, the book of Luke chapter by chapter to see what Jesus did, what he said, how that relates to our life. And uh, we've already seen in the few short chapters, we started just past where uh, Jesus was born and, and is 12 years old. We've gone from there. And we've seen the progression of aggression towards Jesus. The religious leaders, they started off simply just observing him, watching him do the healings, the teachings, crowds gathering, his popularity growing. And that has progressed to where they're now sitting with him, watching him, and now speaking out against him, challenging him. And at the last, we were just... Uh, at the beginning of chapter 6, when he was breaking the Sabbath according to their rules and regulations, and now they're starting to plot against his life, going to kill. They want to find a way to move him along out of life and, and uh, see where he can not be around them. <laughs> By the time uh, we get to chapter 6, verse 12, Jesus is realizing it's time from his ministry, if his ministry is going to continue, it is time to select a few followers to become leaders of his movement, to carry on the work when he's gone. Now, I do not want you to open your Bible today. Well, I mean, every day he wants you to open your Bible, but not here now. There's a reason. We're going to be looking at Luke 6, verses 12 through 16, but there's a reason. I don't want you peeking ahead because there's going to be a little bit of a quiz along the way. So if you've ever been a manager or ever had to do hiring for your business or for your company or ministry, you realize that one of the most difficult and challenging tasks is hiring the right employees. You get that wrong from the start and you have problems going on from there, expensive ones, things that's hard sometimes to turn the company around if you don't get the right person for the right task. So here Jesus was selecting people, not just for a business, but he was selecting people who would impact the future, eternal future of people's lives, who would carry on the work of God himself. Now, can you imagine being the headhunters for those employees, for those disciples? Now, it's interesting what Jesus does. The first thing he does when he has this weighty decision, he has followers that have come around, uh, it's estimated that by chapter six, he's into a year and a half of his three years in ministry. A year and a half, he has many followers, many disciples uh, that are following after him because it says he calls them together and from those he selects 12. So he has disciples, he has followers. And so when Jesus comes to this important decision, we don't see him staying up all night researching on the internet. We don't see him racking his brain for plan A, B, C, and D. What do we find that he does? In chapter 6, we see that, well, this is not the first time, but we see this all-night time with God that Jesus steps into. His balance, his work is in the balance, his whole, the future of his ministry is hanging and what he does is he meets with God first. Now, I don't think it's because I don't think Jesus did think through his choices. I think he used his brain and he used his intuition that spirit led. But I think what he realized was the greatest wisdom, the greatest direction, and the greatest peace would come when he first sought God first and foremost. It's interesting that neither Matthew nor Mark, when talking about this incident, this, this experience in uh, that time when he was choosing his disciples, they don't record this all-night prayer session. It's only Luke. But then when you look at Luke throughout the Bible, he's the one that highlights Jesus' prayer life. He's the one that sees this pattern. He sees Jesus from the very beginning when he was baptized. He gets called out with the Holy Spirit, and he goes and he fills up in the desert. He has some challenging times, but he's with the Spirit. And then he goes and he teaches. He heals first and he teaches and then he prays. He heals, he teaches, he prays. He's filling up and he's pouring out. And this you'll see again and again throughout Luke, more than any other gospel, he realizes that Jesus' power, Jesus' peace, Jesus' wisdom comes because he connects himself continuously with his Father. Now when it goes into... 
And you know what? I did not bring my Bible up here. Can, yeah, can you grab a Bible from behind the seats, please? There is discussion in these first, thank you, Gio. Um, there's discussion in these first few verses of what it actually means when it talks about that, uh, thank you, that first section. Um, all right. says, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. And when morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them whom he also designated apostles. So it says, when he went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God, there's discussion that the original words used here, the original language does not necessarily indicate that it was just about getting away for the activity of prayer. But the words that were used for this getting away to the mountainside to pray also could have strongly indicated that they were talking about he went to the place of prayer where he would connect with God. So there's, this, there's these places that were over in the land over there where up on the mountainside there would be trees that were structured in a circular fashion and this, the the opening. Uh, The top was all open, or there would be stones, actually, that were set up, a little private area where you'd enter into, and it would be open to the sky. And those are places designated. If people wanted to get solitude, not just to be alone, but solitude with God, they would go to these places of prayer. And prayer was more than just talking, more than on your knees, just talking to God. It was a time of communion. It was a time of, of opening up, like the opening up to the sky. There was an opening of your heart. There was an opening of your soul. There was opening of your mind to commune with the one who knows you best. And that's what happens when, when Jesus would get away. And I think what happens with us Every time when we remove ourselves from the distractions of the world, when we take and make a point of getting away from from those things that occupy our brain and beat us down sometimes, we put a pause on duty. We put a pause on doing. And we allow ourselves to find our place again. We get reoriented when we get with God. When we pause long enough, not to say a quick prayer, but to be still, and know in God's presence, he reorients us to who we are, who we're meant to be, what our purpose is, what's going on inside, and God helps us then gain direction, gain wisdom, and gain peace. If Jesus took time to do this, if Jesus, the Son of God, took time to do this, how much more so should we? When you feel God's nudge in your heart, God's nudge in your life, to get away with him, answer that call because he wants to help you find your place again in your soul, to find that peace, to find that direction, to find that purpose he wants to open up to you. There's a quote that says, prayer is not a substitute for work. It's not a substitute for thinking or watching or suffering or giving. Prayer is a support for all the others. It gives us that peace and confidence to step where we need to go next. Our board experienced this. We had some pretty heavy decision-making uh, that we do from time to time a couple of weeks ago. And I-, I know I, for one, did not have that peace in that time. And so we decided as a group we were going to take a few days and come back after praying through, after talking to those that God sends us to, to come back then after that time of prayer and make a decision. And let me tell you, I was able, after that time of stepping away of prayer, of pouring out my heart, of listening to where God sent me to listen, and all of us were praying. When we came back, we didn't have all the answers, but we did have peace about what the next right step was to take. We had peace and confidence about the next right thing to do. And we'll just keep trusting. And God showed up as he does when we step away to meet with him. He will show up. So this is what Jesus does. He takes his time away with God. He comes down the mountain the next morning and he makes his choice without hesitation. 
Now it says in here that he called his disciples and he chose 12. Now disciples, disciple the Greek, the word comes from learner, pupil, student. So a disciple is a student, an ongoing learner. And he says you're, you're going to be, he called his disciples and he also said they would be his apostles. And that comes from a word that means ambassador. So ambassadors, but that comes from the verb apostello, which means sent out. One of my favorite words, sent out. So a shortened meaning of apostle is one who is sent out to be an ambassador for God. We chose 12. Why 12? Teachers of that time, rabbis of that time, if they wanted to specifically pour their time and energy into a few special students, it was a few. One or two is what they chose. Maybe three if they were stretching it. So why did Jesus choose 12? Well, scholarly consensus is that 12 was a symbolic number. As you know, there were 12 tribes of Israel, right? And Israel had originally been set up to be ambassadors for God had originally been set up to represent God's heart, to represent what his love and his grace were going to be like, are like. However, Israel didn't do so good at that, did they? And by the time Jesus comes to earth, Israel had gotten way off track from what they originally intended to be, and the religion of Judaism had stopped depending on God so much as depending on their own abilities, their own uh, their own way to gain divine favor. And that was when they had a bunch of rules and regulations and the focus started to get really skewed of who God is. And so Jesus, when he comes and he calls the 12 apostles, it was like an indictment against the religious system of Judaism. It was a statement that says, I'm not choosing 12 rabbis. I'm not choosing 12 Pharisees. I am choosing 12 ordinary men, imperfect as they are, to be these vessels because we're talking about a whole new message, a message of grace, because we're talking about a whole new kind of kingdom, a kingdom of love. And so if you're going to have a new message and a new kingdom, you have to have new vessels to carry it. And so he established a whole new way by picking these 12 disciples to represent the new Israel, the new kingdom of God. Now, if you were to choose 12 for this incredibly important task of carrying on God's ministry, what would you be looking for? Just toss it out there. Important to have as a representative and ambassador of God himself. What would you look for? Education. education. Yeah, you're going to speak to all sorts of people, so you better have the educated. What else? Be loving. Be loving. Better know how to love, get along with people. Experience. experience. Some leadership experience would be good. Respect for all different peoples, especially if God has open arms. Competence. Competence. They know what they're doing. Responsible. Brave, courageous. Good IQ. Don't want any stupid. Dependable, reliable. How about, I mean, these guys ended up writing. How about some good published works, right? Some writers among you. Show me you've got some talent there. Speaking. Good orators, is that a word we use even more, anymore? All right, well, that's not how God selected them, obviously. The title is A Few Not So Good Men. So redeeminggod.com, I love this site. It, it gave a great summary of who exactly God chose and highlighted just how ordinary and like us these men were. They were very prone to mistakes, as we know, failures of faith. There was no perfect mold. Some of them were married, some were single, some were educated, some were not. The one thing that we're going to find out as we go is the one thing they had in common, none of them, none of them were qualified to do the work that he chose them to do. None of them, not by human standards at least, but clearly God has a way of doing things that is not man's way. He chose disciples who would also be apostles. Before we get into who these disciples were, I, I want to take a pause there because he says, all right, you guys, I'm going to choose you 12. You're going to be my disciples and you're going to be apostles. 
And I can imagine they were all excited. Wow, apostle means you're going to give me a mission. You're going to give me a mission to accomplish a great work, a great responsibility to out there be an ambassador and represent God himself. Let's go. And what happened? At least for the next year and a half, these disciples did pretty much nothing. When you look at the Bible and the tales that are in there, they sat around, they went to parties, they watched Jesus interact with other people, they listened to him teach. I mean, he gave them some assignments now and then, some projects here and there, but where was the mission? Where's my calling ready to go? Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like God has called you? He's, he's put in your heart a task to do, a, a responsibility, something, and, and you're ready. You are ready to take the next step. You are ready to dive in deeper, to go further than you've ever gone before on that task, that ministry, that relationship, that place in your life. You are ready. You've said yes, and you're willing, and you're available, and you have some set of skills, and then nothing. Stand still at least nothing seemingly of significance happens. Nothing. And you wonder, has God forgotten you? Did you hear wrong? Is, did, did I miss something? Where's the mission? And I think we can take encouragement from these four verses here because that's what the ex disciples experienced. And apparently when he said, you will be my disciples and also my apostles, he was emphasizing still, you will be my disciples, you will still be students. I think God's will for them and for us, his first will for our lives is that we see, sit at the feet of Jesus and learn. That is first, foremost, and always. Before we can live like Jesus, we have to learn from Jesus. Before we can do his will, we have to know his will, to know his heart. If it seems like we are not being used by God, then we should take the opportunity to patiently learn from God until he says it's time. There is absolutely nothing with sitting, nothing wrong with sitting and learning as long as we are willing and ready to go when Jesus says go. If he's not asking you to go right now, if he's not putting that guidance and that, that, yes, this is the next right step, then maybe he has more for you to learn at his feet. Being a student, a lifelong disciple, means we are ever willing to learn, ever willing to open our minds and our hearts to learn at the feet of Jesus. It is key to being a disciple, knowing that we cannot, but God can. I think sometimes it's humbling when we're at those places and it's hard because we want to run forward when we have an idea or a thought or a, we know that God's called us to something. We want to make things happen now. And God keeps reminding, I called you not because you've got what it takes. I've called you not because you know the timing. I've called you because you're willing and you're available to me to be the vessel to be filled with what I've got I know what's needed, I know the time, and I know the way. So you wait at my feet until I tell you to go. And I will fill you up. And you will be poured out when it is time and where it's needed. Well, this is what these 12 apostles did, these 12 disciples. And that, I think, is why God used them in such great ways, because they were willing and available to sit and learn and sit and learn again and again and again at Jesus' feet. I love studying the history of our country. I went up Cosette. We went to Monticello, and we got to see Jefferson's house, and now I'm reading a book on Thomas Jefferson. Uh, one time when we went to D.C., I read a book on Abraham Lincoln. There's something about the founding fathers. You know, these are the men, what they went through, how they thought, what they endured, what risks they took, how smart they were or not, what strategies they used. I love learning about that. And I'm so impressed when people can, like, recite who the presidents are in order. You know, I've got George Washington. 
yeah, and Abe Lincoln came along somewhere. But all those in between, it's impressive to me. So I'm thinking, okay, maybe I can't get the you know, founders of our country, but what about the founders of our faith? What about those? Could I, could I manage 12? This is why I don't want you looking in the Bible, because can you? Because I wouldn't have known to name some of these guys. But here's what we're going to do today. So memory has a way of, of being jogged when you have a visual. So this is going to be kind of a little fun test. We're going to go through, because this is what the verses do. They go through, they highlight who were these 12. They list the first 12 disciples, those closest to Jesus, who learned at his feet and became apostles and founded our, our faith and religion. So some you're going to get really easily. And some, not so much. That's okay. I have a little abstract way of looking at things. But when we talk about one of the disciples, and you see this, Peter, Peter the Rock, right? Peter's first name was what? Simon. Simon. Simon, Simon was a fisherman. Was he married or single? Married. Did he have children or no children? We don't know. <laughs> we don't know. He don't, we, I have no idea. But he was married. He was married. He was called Simon, and Jesus gave him the nickname Peter, Rock. And I wonder, was he built like a rock? He was a fisherman. Was he dense like a rock? It seems so. Did he help people stumble over like you stumble over rocks? It seems so. He was brash. This is a disciple, one of strong leader disciples. Brash, impulsive, unsubmissive. He would make bold promises and wouldn't follow through on things. He was one of those people who would jump wholeheartedly into something and then bail out. This was who Jesus chose. But God saw potential in him. And I wonder if that's why he called him the rock, because he saw that with my transformation, he can become more solid. Or perhaps it wasn't so much that Peter would become a rock so much as he wanted Peter to always remember, I'm the rock you need to count on. You need a constant reminder, Peter, to count on me as your solid base. Well, we see how Peter was transformed from the Gospels to Acts. He went from this rough, calloused fisherman to this mighty leader, speaker, writer that helped transform lives even to our very own today. He depended on God even to death. This is one of our founders, all of them as we know except one, uh, possibly two, but they all died, martyrs. Peter was crucified <laughs> upside down. Uh, he did not want to be crucified the regular way. He was not worthy to die like Jesus died. And I just think it's so cool. When we see a rock, we can think how he, how God transformed him from stubborn rock to a solid rock because he depended on the rock of ages, right? Okay, so the second, the second disciple. See if you can guess this one. I can find it. Hang on. Okay. You see this? Number one. Okay. No? <laughs> it could fit many, but I'm going to say no. Um, number one. Okay, I will explain this as I go. First disciple that is recorded that followed Jesus was Andrew, right? Andrew, number one. Well, it's kind of interesting. So this is Simon Peter's brother, Andrew. So he was the first one. He was John the Baptist's disciple until he saw Jesus. And he started following after Jesus. He and this other disciple started following after Jesus. Jesus turns around and says, what do you want? And Andrew says, we just want to hang out with you. Just spend some one-on-one -on -one time. And that's what they did for the rest of the day. They spent one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus. And from then on, Andrew was sold. He no longer was a disciple of John the Baptist. He became a follower of Jesus. And the first thing Andrew does, he runs to his brother Simon. And he tells him about Jesus. And he goes and he chooses the first person he thinks of his brother. And he brings him to Jesus, right? Andrew had a way one-on-one -on -one with people. It was also Andrew when Jesus was needing food to feed the crowd. He says, I, I need food. How are we going to find it? Let's go out and see what's out there. Philip starts arguing with him. Andrew doesn't say a word. Andrew's opposite of Peter. <laughs> Peter was loud and brash. Andrew was the silent thinking kind. He didn't say a word. He just went out, found one boy that had one lunch, and he brought it to the one person he knew could make a difference. 
It didn't matter if he didn't have millions of dollars and millions of ways. He only needed one for one miracle. And that's exactly what happened. When Greeks came, they wanted to see Jesus. Philip, we're going to learn about him. They approached Philip. Philip had a Greek name. They thought, oh, he should know what we should do. Philip didn't know what he should do. So he goes to Andrew. And, Andrew, and he says, Philip, I mean, and Philip says to Andrew, what are we going to do? These people want to go see Jesus. They're Greeks. And he's like, well, let's bring them to Jesus then. He's the one person they really need to meet. And so he introduces them to their Savior. As far as we know, Andrew never preached a sermon. We have no recordings that he ever founded a church. And he never wrote a book in the Bible, as far as we know. But tradition says that he took the gospel all the way north to Scotland and then over to what is now Russia. And he was ultimately crucified near Athens. It says he was crucified on a saltier, which is an X-shaped cross. Now, the reason for his crucifixion is interesting. It was because he took a risk and led this one person who then became his demise. He led the wife of a Roman governor to Christ. And because of that, her husband asked her to recant her devotion to Jesus. She refused. And so they said, okay, we're going to crucify Andrew. The difference that one can make when the value of our one and only is held high and offered to one person at a time. That's Andrew, right? All right, I don't think this is going to stand. We're going to prop him up. Okay, so the next one. Ah. All right, who would that disciple be? <laughs> do, you, do you know what this is? Well, okay, rocket would be like that. Okay, it's like fiery, and you're like, boom, down to the ground. Okay, close. James, right? Sons of thunder. James and John. We're going to talk about James first. James. James and his brother John were the sons of Zebedee, right? And I'll, I'll get this to, I'll get it in a minute. Zebedee, their family was very prominent religiously, politically, economically. They had a lot going for them. And James gave it all up when he met Jesus. He gave up all that prominence because he was so passionate and zealous for Jesus to a fault because James was so passionate that when a city did not receive Jesus well, he says, all right, Lord, you just, you just tell me. You just say the word. You want me to go ahead and command fire to come down from heaven and consume this city because they're not listening to you. They're not accepting you. Jesus is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, James' zealousness for Jesus, he happened to be so passionate that he ended up thinking that those who weren't as passionate about Jesus, those who hated God, were to be consumed by fire. He didn't have the passionate love that Jesus did, not at first. James was also ambitious and self-serving. It was he and his brother, John, that went to Jesus uh, and asked if they could have a couple thrones on either side of him. When they get to heaven, we would like the highest position. We come from a good family. We have money. We have power. We want our thrones next to you. And Jesus says, okay, yeah, let's talk about what this looks like, really. There's a lot of suffering that comes before the thrones. And they are so confident. They're like, no problem. We've got this. We can suffer. We can suffer. Despite the dark side of James's passion, Jesus still chose him, not only to be one of the 12, but of all people. Jesus chose Peter, James, and John, James and John the brothers, to be the special ones that came with him to the upper room when they went to go heal this girl. He left all the other disciples, chose these three to come up to see him raise a girl from the dead. It was also Peter, James, and John he took up to the mountain of transfiguration. Now you would think if James struggled with his ego, he struggled with a power trip, that Jesus would be like, no, this is just going to fuel the fire, right, for James? But he doesn't. I wonder if maybe Jesus thought this was going to be an opportunity instead of avoiding those places of weakness. I'm going to help James work through them until he can overcome. John MacArthur in his book, 12 Ordinary Men, writes that James wanted a crown of glory. Jesus gave him a cup of suffering. He wanted power. Jesus gave him servanthood. He wanted a place of prominence. 
Jesus gave him a martyr's grave. He was the first apostle to be put to death. He was beheaded. But it's interesting because history tells us that as he was led off, the man who was holding his chains, he witnessed to him about God. And by the time he got there, the guy holding the chains was converted. Now, the old James would have been like, God, bring fire down on this man and set me free. That would be the old James. The new James is sharing God's heart with the one who has him captive. And it says the man gave his life to Jesus, and both of them then got beheaded. And that's how their end came. John. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, okay. All right. So John would be the one to have a wall sticker that said L-O-V-E with hearts, right? Maybe not. Um, but okay, man, you would have gotten it anyway. All right. So John, his brother, there should be lightning going through the, the heart actually, but John, his brother, James. So John, as much as we know that John was about love later on, he was just as fiery as James. He was with James saying, yeah, bring down the fire. His, his, Jesus called he and his brother the sons of thunder, right? He was also the one that was with James when they go to ask for their, you know, specialty thrones on either side of God. And he was the one that rebuked a man. Here's a man casting out demons from this poor soul. And he's saving the man's life. He wasn't a disciple, though. And so what does John do? He goes and he rebukes the guy and says, he can't do that. He's not one of us. We have an inner circle here. We have a group. We like to keep pure and clean. He's not a disciple like us. Stop it. And Jesus ends up rebuking him. He's like, let him go. Let him go. He was a little narrow-minded and aggressive. But as John sat at the feet of Jesus, that narrow-mindedness got expanded, and though he never lost his passion, it became balanced with truth and love. This is what happens when we sit at Jesus' feet. We can have some of the most horrid traits about us, and Jesus can transform so much that Jesus known as the, John was known as the disciple of love. He became, he went from a fisherman to a writer, a very poetic writer, talked about God is love. He loved the world so much he sent his son to die. He loved his disciples, wanted to be one with them so that we would be able to love like him. He was the only apostle that we know that's recorded that didn't die a martyr. He was sent to Patmos to be exiled there. But he was allowed to return to Ephesus where he died in A.D. 98 from old age. And it says the last bit of his years, you would hear him repeatedly saying, my little children love one another. My little children love one another. He couldn't stop saying that. So we would get the message of love. Okay. This is an obscure one. A box square, contained, no, did you both say Thomas, oh, <laughs> all right, so this is a hard one, it's very abstract, all right, what you see, what you feel is important because it makes sense, and you have to stay within the parameters, that's where it's safest, in the box, don't go outside the lines, don't go outside the box, this was Philip. All right, Philip, and let me make my case. Philip, box man. So Philip was a very concrete guy. He liked his numbers. He was always focused on what was rather than what could be. Very practical and wanted to do things by the book. Jesus found Philip. All it says, he found him, and, and Philip, he said, follow me, and Philip did. Then Philip told his friend Nathaniel about Jesus, and the words he used were, come and see. Nathaniel asked, basically, why should I go to this man? And all Philip says is, I don't understand it. I don't get it. Just come and see. You'll see when you get to Jesus. Crowd of 5,000, feeding the 5,000. Philip was the one that Jesus turned to and said, Philip, we got to feed these people. Now, Philip, being a numbers guy, has already been running the tallies in his head. He's been head counting. He's been looking at their budget here, and he's like, there is no way. Are you crazy? 
We don't have enough money to pay for these food. There's no way. Now, he had seen the miracles of Jesus. He had seen the healings. He had been at Cana seeing the water turn to wine. He saw all this, and yet he still did not. He couldn't get his head around God doing the impossible. Outside the box thinking was not Philip. Later, as I said, the Greeks... The Greeks came to see Jesus. Philip is flustered by the request. He doesn't know the proper protocol. What do you do with a Greek who wants to see Jesus? He's looking through a stack of papers. There's no policy on it. So he goes to Andrew. And Andrew, of course, is the one that says, just take him to Jesus. It's that simple. One more example was in the upper room, the Last Supper. All ministry long, Jesus has been teaching his disciples that he and the Father are one You've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. He repeats it over and over, and he does it again at the, at the upper room, in which Philip says, Lord, yes, yes, we get it. We get it. Just show us the Father. Just show us the Father, and we'll be good. And you can just hear Jesus' sigh. How many times do I have to go over this? It was just too much. It blew Philip's mind, and so he repeats again, Philip, we are one, God and I. Somewhere along the line, though, Philip learns that God is bigger than numbers, that God is way outside the box, so much so that he, too, was willing to die so that others might know of this impossible-to-believe love. Tradition has it that he ministered in Central Asia Minor, and he preached as far up into present-day France, which was Gaul back then, and he died by crucifixion and stoning. These are people, ordinary people like you and I, who once they got a hold of Jesus' love were so transformed they were willing to give their lives. All right? This one's going to be a little tricky. Shady. Yeah, it would be good. No. <laughs> All right. This is very abstract. You'd have to actually look up in the Bible. Okay, so this is Nathaniel, Bartholomew. They say he's one and the same, right? Well, this was the one that Philip brought to Jesus. Nothing is said about Nathaniel in the Bible except for this one little bit in the first chapter of John. When Philip comes and he says they found the Messiah, Nathaniel responds with the famous, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nazareth was rough. It was, you know, unrefined, looked down upon. And in that one statement, this is what Nathaniel's recorded to have said, we find a little bit of judgment, right, in Nathaniel's heart, a little bit of prejudice going on. But when Philip says, come and see for yourself, Nathaniel goes. He doesn't let that judgment get in the way of truth. You know, the remedy for judgment, the remedy for prejudice is being willing to take another look, an honest look at the reality from another's point of view. And so this is what Nathaniel did. He took another look. There was an openness, no matter what his initial leanings were. And so he allows Philip to take him. He sees the truth for himself. When Jesus says to him, he says, Nathaniel, behold, I see a true Israelite, genuine through and through. And Nathaniel then says, how can you know this about me? And Jesus says, I saw you under the fig tree when Philip called you. And Nathaniel answers, you are the son of God. Now, my question was, what made this leap from skeptical to believing? And just a little bit of a twist here. Sitting under a fig tree back in Judaism, sitting under a fig tree represented one who wants to seek reflection, who reflects, who meditates, and is a person of peace. When you sat under a fig tree, this is what it represented. You like to reflect, meditate, and you are a person of peace. If Jesus knew that Nathaniel was the kind to sit under a fig tree, whether he saw them physically there in his mind in a vision or just knew him in his soul, he also would have known Nathaniel's judgment and his contempt and his prejudice. But Jesus looks at Nathaniel and chooses of the two to focus on the positive to focus on what he knows Nathaniel can be, true, honest Israelite who seeks peace. And Nathaniel realizes this is someone who gets me, who knows my true heart, knows and sees the real me, and that is someone I want to follow. And so as we know, this is all we have of his calling, but in that instant, he recognized something about Jesus that it would take the other apostles years to get. You are the son of God. 
There are various accounts of where he went from Persia to India, Turkey, Armenia. He died a martyr around 68 AD. Some say he was crucified, others that he was skinned alive and beheaded, and others that he was tied up in a sack and cast into the sea. All of those are bad. However, his death, though, he experienced something about Jesus that he was willing to give up his life in order for others to sit, know him too. He wanted others to know there's a God despite all your negative sees who you are. And he helped others see that light too. All right, moving right along. Measurement cup. He was weighed and measured and found wanting. Yes, but there was another one. Okay, Matthew. Matthew, the tax collector, right? The worst of the worst. We know about Matthew. We're not going to go into him. I had a whole, and Mark and I talked about how he was the IRS mafia man, right? He was one that profited from others. He betrayed Israel. He worked for the Roman government. He found loopholes to use as nooses for people's necks. The worst of the worst. And yet when Jesus called him, when Jesus called him, he was the redeemed of redeemed. And he was then able to realize that God measures him differently than how other people measured. He saw his heart, and Matthew's heart changed. And the first thing he does is he brings Jesus to the worst of the worst so he can redeem them too. He became a writer. The genealogy reveals God's redemption and restoration. And tradition says he continued to minister among the Jewish centers before he was burned at the stake. Just a few more. We're getting down. All right, you guys are going to get this one. Thomas. Thomas, the questioning one, right? He was a pessimist. He was a fatalist. And he was a skeptic. He was doubting Thomas. Those words are not in the Bible. But every time you turn around, he is doubting. He is seeing the negative side of things. Remember when Jesus waited till Lazarus was dead? And then he's like, okay, now let's go to Bethany and go, you know, visit the family. And Thomas is like, whoa, 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 don't you remember? You made a heck of a lot of enemies over there. They're trying to kill you now. But Thomas is the one that says, you know what? Let's go. Let's go, and we're going to die with him. Wasn't a positive thought, but he was courageous, right? A pessimistic hero. All right? So he also had skepticism. In John 14, Jesus tells them that he's going away to prepare a place for them, but they know the way to follow. And Thomas speaks up and says, what, what are you talking about? We don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And that's when we get the famous. Jesus says, I'm the way. Have you not gotten that yet, Thomas? And the doubts continue after Jesus is resurrected, right? All the disciples say, we found Jesus. Jesus is alive. He's great. He's, he's coming. He's going. This is great. And Thomas says, nah, I don't believe you. Not until I put my fingers through his scars and sides, and I'm not going to believe you. And so eight days later, Jesus shows up, speaks directly to Thomas, says, go ahead, put your, put your fingers here and here. And he believes. He believes so much. Apparently didn't have those big doubts again because he went throughout Babylon, modern-day Iraq, later to Persia, all the way to India, spreading the good news of the reality of Jesus Christ. And like his fellow apostles, he died a martyr. It's interesting how he died. A spear was stuck through his side. Kind of an interesting reminder, right, of how he came to believe. A radio. Whoops, it's backwards. A radio. Which disciple represents this? Oh, you will never get it. Um, oh, okay, let me just tell you. James, the son of Alphaeus. Have you even heard of him? James, the son of Alphaeus. That is the only thing scripture tells us about this apostle. So you're wondering, what am I going to possibly say about him, right? All right, here we learn the son of Alphaeus. It's the same name as Matthew's father. Matthew's father's name was Alphaeus. So James, the son of Alphaeus, could they have been brother and brother, brothers? I don't think so. They probably just a coincidence that they both had the same name. The only thing we know about James is in Mark 15, he's called James the less or James the little. That's all we know about poor James. Maybe the other James, the fisherman, was so big and burly, he was strong, James was of a smaller stature. I don't know. History doesn't tell us what he did, where he went, or how he died. So what can we possibly learn from this disciple? 
I think sometimes we can serve God for years and nobody will see us. Nobody will thank us. Nobody will write about us. We'll have very little to no recognition. But it doesn't mean you weren't called. It doesn't mean your work doesn't matter. God chose James for a purpose, and he chooses, he chooses you and I. He's not interested in the height of your resume, but in the height of your heart. And he knows even when you feel invisible and small, with him filling you up, great and powerful things can and will happen. You think of the invisibility of the wind and an atom. We can't see gravity. We can't see a thought or an idea or radio waves. But what a difference they make in our lives, right? Invisible does not mean without purpose. We can take encouragement from James the Lesser. All right, now, three more to go. Simon the Zealot. Ha-ha. <laughs> Simon the Zealot, right? Simon the Zealot. This should be a curved dagger, by the way, a small curved dagger. The zealots were this religious political organization. Their primary goal was to overthrow the Roman government. They hated Roman occupation. Anybody remotely associated with the Roman occupation and government, they were after them like terrorists, covert violence, militant outlaws. They recruited and trained a group of secret assassins called the Sicarii. The Sicarii, they mean dagger men, and they would keep these these, these bent little daggers in their cloaks, and they'd go around, and the first chance they would get, they'd find a Roman politician or soldier, and they would slit their throats or stab them through the back to pierce their heart and then quickly put them back in their cloaks again. This was Simon, the disciple. I think Matthew would have been just the kind of Roman supporter that Simon would have loved to have killed. I'm sure Matthew was a bit nervous for a while, around Simon the Zealot. We don't know anything more about Simon except his violent zeal and political leanings. And the only thing I could garner from this was that it shows that Jesus wasn't scared of even the most violent or aggressive of followers. Whatever we struggle with, Jesus says, come and follow me. I can use that energy that you're using for good right now. I can use it for bad. I can use it for good. Maybe he saw in Simon someone willing to take a risk he just needed to shape the direction, which apparently he did. Because instead of Simon overthrowing the government, Simon's heart got overthrown. And he became so devoted to the kingdom of God that he too was killed for spreading the good news. Tradition has it he went to North Africa. And others say he went to Britain during the Roman occupation. Wonder what he did there. Still others put him in Persia. Maybe he went to all these areas, but it says that he was crucified, although some say along with Jude, he was sawn in two for his death, willing to risk it all. Okay, you're not going to get this one either, but I just have to, if you just, you know, we have two disciples left. Ha! The good Judas. Yeah, those are the only two left. We've got Judas bad, Judas good. So this is Judas. He is the son of James, not any James that we know of. Okay, why do I have a toy? Well, the only thing we know about Ju Judas is he's also known as Thaddeus or Labia, Labus, Labus. Both names are probably nicknames. Thaddeus would be close to calling someone a mama's boy. Okay, that's Thaddeus. Labus means heart child. So there's a picture we get of a tender, childlike heart in the soul of this man. In this heart, we see one place revealed in John 14. It's where Jesus is saying that he will reveal himself to those who love him. And Judas Thaddeus Labus says, Lord, how is it that you will show yourself to us, but not to the world? It's like he sees, he's like, there is such this good thing. How can you keep it from those who need it the most? His child, compassionate, simple heart. And Jesus, of course, you know, explains that he's going to reveal himself to everyone who loves him and anyone who wants to know about him. Well, tradition has that Judas carried the love of Christ to what is now the country of Turkey. He was beaten to death for his faith. But before that, there are numerous accounts of how he healed the king of Edessa and had a great impact on the people in that country. And the final one, oh. Lots and lots of money. Whew. 
We know who this is, right? Our favorite character of all. Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot. Now, he's the one that, you know, he's always the last on the list, and he's portrayed as one of the greatest villains of all time, right? Now, I have my doubts. I am not convinced that Judas intended to kill Jesus. In many ways, I think Judas was just like several of the other apostles, including Peter. Judas wanted the Roman government overthrown. He wanted Christ to be set up as a king. He wanted to gain a throne for himself. He had originally signed on with Jesus because perhaps he thought Jesus was going to pass out that glory and honor and riches, but it never happened. They just kept getting poorer and poorer and getting more and more enemies around them. He was not getting rich the way he thought he would. Things were not changing in the government. The Messiah was not standing up for what he needed to stand up for. He stole a few coins along the side. No one was going to notice. Jesus just wasn't doing what was right, wasn't operating the way Judas thought he should. So Judas gave him a little nudge, right? And he believed that, that if he could get Jesus to act, he would hand Jesus over to the religious authorities and the government, and when they threatened to kill him, Jesus would stand and defend himself, and the long-awaited revolt would finally arrive. So you look at Judas. He was a planner. Right? He was a coin collector with sticky fingers. He was a strategist. Though his focus was slightly off center with Jesus. Many people think that Judas sold Jesus out, which, okay, there's lots of evidence for that, but he probably saw it as Jesus selling himself out, not realizing and taking advantage of the potential. He really had to do something that they'd all been waiting for. Where Judas struggled... I think is a place we can all identify with. It's the place of trust. Trusting God's plan versus our own. Trusting his timing versus our own. His way versus ours. His lack of trust, Judas's lack of trust was no different than any of the other disciples. Except in the end, their despair led them to run back to God for deliverance. Judas couldn't seem to find a way beyond the darkness to see the light that was being offered to him. I think Judas is a reminder that we all have things that blind us. We all have things that obscure fully trusting God. We want our plans, our ways, and while they might seem right and good to us, without God truly at the helm, they can ultimately lead us far from the light that we need when we try to force our own way. The conclusion, the 12 apostles, they were human just like us. They had their strengths and they had a heck of a lot more weaknesses. They had their own unique way of doing things. But what made them effective, what carried on God's work to make such a profound difference in the lives of so many up until their deaths, differences in people's lives, including yours and mine. These are the founders. These are why we believe what we believe because of their lives, what they gave. We applaud and think of the founders of our country. These are the ones we should remember. Their willingness to be students, to constantly learn at Jesus' feet again and again and to let him transform them. So when they poured out, it was not self. It was not their own way. It was not their own plan. It was not their own power, but it was God's. Acts 4.13 says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Jesus, thank you for letting these tidbits of the disciple stories be recorded so we can... We can read and remember and take courage and encouragement from it. God, let us be willing as they were, available as they were, as faulty as each of us are, as we struggle, the mistakes we make in our lives, the, the, the frustrations we have, the wanting our own ways. God, remind us that if we just keep coming back to places of solitude with you, if we keep coming back to spend time to listen to you, to fill up with you, that you too can use us. You've called us and you will use us in just the way you need when we open ourselves to you like the disciples did back then. 
God, we look forward to your transformation in our lives, and we can't wait to one day sit and talk and meet your closest followers and share stories of your greatness. In your name we pray. Amen.